Okay, thank you all for coming along today to hear about the New Paris Agreement on Climate Change. <clears throat> Just this morning, Ban Ki-moon said, when talking about our future, together we sink or swim. And I think that this is no more true in any other context than climate change. Before kicking off, I'd like to very briefly introduce the hosts of this event and extend our gratitude for their support. This event is being hosted by the Cambridge Politics and International Studies Department, the Lauderpac Centre for International Law, the Cambridge International the <laughs> Centre for International Sustainable Development Law, the Law Faculty, and the Centre for the Environment, Energy and Natural Resources Governance. Here on behalf of these organisations, we have co-chairs Dr. De Pledge and Dr. Goering, and our guest speaker today is Dr. Kodonia Sedja. Thank you all for making this event possible. We're incredibly fortunate to have you here today and to be able to benefit from your significant expertise in this field. Dr. De Pledge is an affiliated lecturer in the Department of Politics and International Studies here at Cambridge. Her main research interest lies in international climate change politics and negotiations. And in fact, Dr. De Pledge is the author on the book on climate change, The International Climate Change Regime. Yeah, one of two authors. <laughs> Dr. De Pledge is a former staff member of the UN Climate Change Secretariat. She's also worked as a writer for the Earth Negotiations Bulletin, reporting on climate change, ozone, and biodiversity meetings. She currently serves on the editorial board of the journals Climate Policy and Global Environmental Politics and manages the Climate Policy Blog. Dr. Gehring is an expert in the Centre for European Legal Studies a Fellow and Director of Studies in Law at Hughes and a Fellow of the Lauderpac Centre for International Law. He's previously served as a Tutor in Sustainable Development Law and was a Fellow in Law at Robinson College in 2012. He's a Visiting Professor in several law faculties around the world and was formerly working at the Cambridge Politics and Environmental uh, and International Studies Department. He is also an Affiliated Lecturer in the Department of Land Economy and a founding fellow of the Centre for Environment, Energy and Natural Resources Governance. Um, and now I will hand over to our chairs, Dr De Pledge, to introduce our speaker, Mary Clare. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Now, I was very pleased to be asked uh, to chair this meeting um, here today which is aimed at giving us all a chance to reflect a little bit more deeply on the Paris Agreement. Now, I was particularly pleased to be here because it's been, what, six, seven weeks since the agreement was adopted? And I like to think I know a little bit about climate change. And I'm still in two minds about what I think about this agreement. On the one hand, I know it's a real triumph for diplomacy and politics. There is no doubt about that at all. On the other hand... The INDCs, the national pledges within the Paris Agreement, are simply not consistent with a climatically safe world. And something else that's quite important to me personally is that legally, there is no doubt that, at least for industrialised countries, the Paris Agreement represents a step backwards from the previous set of targets they had in the Kyoto Protocol. So in that sense, at least, the Paris Agreement is actually going backwards rather than forwards. And I ask myself, how do I square this circle between the political triumph and a lot of the substantive weakness? Well, I'm clearly in the right place um, to, to think about this, um, especially guided by such, a, such an esteemed and experienced uh, guest lecturer as Marie-Claire Cordonier Sega, who hardly needs any introduction, um, but... Since it's my job, let me remind you all that Marie-Claire is an expert jurist, scholar, and leader in international law and policy on sustainable development. She's the senior director for the Centre for International Sustainable Development Law, and also chairs the Climate Law and Governance Consortium, uh, which convened a very important event, the Climate Law and Governance Day in Paris itself. Uh, she's a prolific writer. You'll all have read her work, I'm sure. Um, authored apparently 18 books and over 80 papers. I say it was probably more than that, but this is what it says here. Uh, she also co-edits the CUP series on implementing sustainable development treaties, serves on several editorial boards, as you'd expect. Uh, she's an affiliated fellow of the Lauterpach Centre, uh, advisor to C Energy. And as well as these Cambridge appointments, she's an international professor in the Faculty of Law in Chile, 
a senior research associate for the Centre for International Forestry Research and rapporteur of the International Law Association's Natural Resources Committee. Now, based on all of that, as you'll expect, she has, it says here, 20 years of experience in international treaty negotiations and programmes spanning 79 countries. So not only experience in the international side of things, but also in national implementation, which, as I'm sure you'll all agree, is particularly important uh, post-Paris. Uh, she's an advisor to the UN Environment Programme and is fluent in several languages, including English, French and Spanish. Uh, so with that introduction, Marie-Claire, um, please come and take the floor. Uh, Marie-Claire will be speaking for um, about half an hour, yeah, till about quarter to two, which would give us time then for some questions, and we aim to wrap up, wrap up at about uh, five to two. Marie-Claire, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Joanna. You know, I had no idea that you'd been with the ENB. <laughs> The rest of your CV is legend, but I, I hadn't been aware of that. So um, uh, I'm going to I'm going to we're going to tell stories later about chemo. Um, hello, and um, I guess uh, Amanda, you deserve all thanks, especially. Um, we had an early version of this talk in the Laudapak Center a couple of weeks ago, and Amanda came to me afterward and said there are actually a few more people at the law faculty who would be interested in this, and I said no, not really. You are proven correct. <laughs> I am proven wrong. <laughs> I believe you're interested now. Um, thank you so much for coming and for taking the time out from your very busy studies to, um, to talk about this agreement. Um, I'm going to do two know your audience questions. How many people have laboriously and painstakingly read through the entire text of the treaty? Oh, you're sad. <laughs> okay, that's too bad. My, my sympathy is for the 10 of you put up your hand. Um, the rest of you, quite reasonable. Um, and then, how many of you have ever been part of um, a, an event at a climate change conference of the parties? Yep, okay, well, I expect that, yeah, Climate Law and Governance Day counts. Um, yes, obviously. <laughs> okay, good. So we have a mix of experience in the room. Some people who don't spend all their time reading um, boring footnotes to um, uh, equally boring international treaty language, and, uh, and, and, and some people who have buried themselves in the um, frequently depressing um, uh, context of climate change negotiations, which recently hasn't been quite as depressing. Um, I'm not going to answer the challenge that Joanna has put forward, except by my usual optimism. Um, in terms of whether or not the Paris Treaty can get us where we want to go. Partly because of my own view of international law and how it intersects with public policy and with um, governance systems. Um, I think that international treaties can achieve a certain set of targets and provisions which governments have agreed to achieve. I think for the rest, we all need to be involved to actually make it happen. And that includes just as much um, national and local decision makers as it includes civil society, the private sector, investors, and others. So I'm not going to say, can the Paris Agreement alone get us somewhere? What I'm going to say is, this is what it does do and the framework that it sets in place. And now the question is implementation. And here's a few challenges we might want to consider. All right? So it's a bit of a nuanced answer. I think um, in terms of context, uh, probably only time for two minor caveats slash footnotes. First, um, the lawyers in my research institute, which is a, a, a research and education charity based at McGill in Canada, but with folk here in Cambridge and Nairobi and in um, Santiago, Chile. Um, we had lawyers on about 40 delegations advising their heads of state or their ministers. So my view is conditioned by their struggles. The High Ambition Coalition, the Most Vulnerable Countries Forum, the hunger strikes in Warsaw, the um, incredible shifts of position um, by the Philippines from we want to develop our oil, thank you very much, to we're forming a new coalition of most vulnerable countries. Um, all of that drama is kind of part of, for me, what has gone into this text. The terrible failures in Copenhagen, the successes, modest though they were in Cancun um, and in Durban, um, even, even the earlier meetings, which we were involved in hosting in Montreal, the very first meeting of the protocol when we realized that it wasn't going to work, um, which for international lawyers is a little bit disappointing, that, that informs 
my view of the treaty. Some of what I tell you won't be found in the treaty text, I guess is what I'm saying. Second point, equally important, is that international cooperation is about more than law. International negotiations are about a grander type of politics. And in Paris, that was hideously apparent for all the wrong reasons. And what I mean, of course, is that three weeks prior to the meeting of the world leaders, there were some terrible attacks. There was loss of life. The law faculty that co-hosted our event, Climate Law and Governance Day, um, lost family members, friends, um, close, close colleagues of their faculty itself, um, and, and, and family of the students. And when the governments came together three weeks later, they were faced with the same kind of choice, and it was apparent in every intervention and in every request made by the French chair that we probably haven't seen since the Doha trade negotiations uh, were launched right after September 11th in the US. And it was actually a choice that we as a group were faced with as well as co-hosts of the law and governance stream of the um, discussions because essentially we were asked, are, are you going to cancel you know, after this has happened? It's not safe in Paris. And we were reminded by our Parisian colleague and our South African colleague, who probably had a right to say, um, if you cancel, who wins? And there's, there's only one answer to that, right? So, of course, we didn't cancel. And, of course, the world leaders turned up. But, of course, they also understood that even above and beyond the um, horrific necessity of responding to climate change, there was a very clear message that could be sent or not sent by Paris about our ability to cooperate as an international community. And that message was high politique. That message was not a kind of message that you can send in any other way except, yes, we will be here, yes, we will cooperate, yes, we will find a way through this problem as a world community. So we were in a very special moment in Paris, three weeks after devastating terrorist attacks, in a state of high uncertainty, negotiations suspended for five or six hours while bomb threats were dealt with, People told not to gather in groups of more than five because they might be a target. Ministers being asked to fly by the name of undersecretary so that people wouldn't read your agenda online and turn up with all kinds of intentions. It was an awkward scenario, but it was also an urgent one. And it added a level of urgency, which became very, very apparent during the meetings and the um, treaty uh, end game. I promised you an overview of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Um, for those who have spent weeks trawling through the various iterations of the text since the first versions came up out in the, in the context of Lima, and for those of us that are really sad and were even before that not just reading the various mechanisms that were being created by the parties after the failure in Copenhagen, but also reading the bilateral agreement between China and the US that helped us in right before Lima to see what those two countries might actually be able to agree to. Um, uh, I will apologize if any of this does seem repetitive as opposed to a bit of a roadmap. Um, hopefully it's a useful roadmap. As most of you know, under Article 2, the Paris Agreement aims to strengthen global response to the threat of climate change in the context of sustainable development and efforts to eradicate poverty by holding the increase in global average temperatures to well below 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5. Now, anyone who's seen the newspapers is aware of the grand drama that was associated with that set of options, right? Um, even until the very last minute, we had three different possibilities in the text under square brackets. I tend to be a bit agnostic about square brackets. Um, on the Monday of the final week of the negotiations, I was speaking in the International Chamber of Commerce to a group of mainly international arbitrators and lawyers who um, admitted freely to me that they hadn't spent more than one or two build minutes on climate change in their lifetime. Um, and, and my chair, an, an, an amazing lady, um, truly, um, was walking through the draft text that had come out and was counting square brackets. She was actually counting square brackets one by one, which you just don't do, right? One, two. No, come on. <laughs> You're bracketing one text. And, and obviously she wanted to make a point at the end about the thousands that were in the text. And I nudged her and I said, I know you don't do much on climate change from my talk before, but you know, for those who are actually working on this, we're aware there's only seven choices left in the whole text that are meaningful. I, I just wanted you to know that so that you didn't stand up and you know, look silly. <laughs> um, and she said, thank you. 
and you could see her abandon her effort to quit. That was because we knew very well that those seven or eight choices that were meaningful, do you or don't you, um, hold people to the commitment on um, um, ensuring that human rights are respected in your adaptation and mitigation measures? Do you or don't you take a high ambition target? Do you or don't you include liability and compensation as well as recognition of loss and damage in the text? Those were the choices that were still remaining to be made, and they were going to be made by heads of state. At a certain moment, the French presidency was going to be telephoning Obama and others and asking for permission to change their own negotiator's position, and that was what was required. What does the treaty then do? It accepts basically the highest possible ambition, carefully worded to be sensitive to two sets of concerns. One was the coalition of most vulnerable countries and high ambition countries that have built over the course of four or five months right before the agreement, and their willingness to commit to something that was even higher ambition than two degrees. And the other was the concerns of the 40 or so countries that because they don't have very large final emissions, they don't have high emissions um, themselves as a country, um, a lot of other countries think are irrelevant, who are going to lose their very existence as countries if climate change isn't kept below 1.5. You can imagine most of the small island developing states that I'm referring to. We had lawyers advising several of them. They've been desperate now for many years, but they're also getting really good at negotiating. And what you find in the end is a recognition of that, pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5. Now, anyone who does an analysis of the bottom-up 185 country action plans on climate change that were submitted as, back before Paris, intended nationally determined contributions, can see very clearly that the commitments that governments were prepared to make in Paris or right before Paris won't get us there. Um, some of the numbers I've seen say that it will be around 3.7 degrees warning, which means we lose not only all of those 40 countries, and everyone's seen the papers lately, becoming a migrant isn't really something that everyone aspires to, yeah? And uh, we also lose most of our coastal cities, most likely, yeah? So this is an issue. It's a problem. But at the same time, it's the best illustration of what those nationally determined contributions, they lost the intended, which I see as something that's actually quite positive, um, in order to help us to understand what the bottom-up approach really means. So Article 3 brings in to the treaty framework those nationally determined contributions, those climate action plans that are being registered by, I think it's 188 countries now that have handed theirs in, yeah? It, there's a slightly lower number of nationally determined contributions because the European Union hands theirs in as a block, yeah? But essentially what you're dealing with then is a set of commitments, not just for adaptation, not just for mitigation, but also for specific measures that they'll take. And they're widely diverse. As a lawyer, of course, I noticed right away that almost all of them are talking about legal and institutional reform. So that's a huge amount of work that's waiting for us, just as people working on law. But if you think about it, in order to be able to implement commitments on energy, finance, agriculture, water, coastal zone management, construction, transport, you're talking about a change to an entire governance framework and a development plan of a country. You're not talking about one small climate measure that we adopt in three years by putting it solely through our parliament. I've helped countries to do that. I think that's a valuable thing to do. But the nationally determined contributions mean more. Mean more. And that's going to be huge. That's going to be huge for the rest of our lives as people involved in this field, um, if we take it seriously. A lot of countries are already doing so, thank God given what's going on in the world. Um, all right, so Article 3, we've got the nationally determined contributions. We've got the commitment to prepare, communicate, and maintain successive nationally determined contributions. We have stock taking. We have peer review. We have processes written into the treaty at various articles, whereby you take all of those publicly available national plans, you add them up, you look at whether they're going to be effective, you look at who's failing, and you think of ways to help them. That approach, for those of us who have lived in Montreal or are familiar with the Montreal Protocol, isn't a completely ineffective one. It's a different one. It's not binding targets with penalties that no one has the courage to enforce politically, and we know they don't. 
and that half the countries with a lot of emissions can't even sign on to because their own democratic governments won't let them. It's something different. It's an approach that I think is very much one of sustainable development, where you're recognizing that countries may want to make these changes, but most of them, with four people in their environment ministry who even know anything about climate change, aren't in condition to just run ahead and do something effective. Indeed, many of the things they do might turn out to be worse than what they already have. And I've seen some stunning examples of that. People facilitating the building of dikes and then realizing that the concrete, of course, created more emissions than their entire country for <laughs> two years. Mm. Um, and benefited somebody's brother-in-law more than anybody else. <laughs> okay, so in the treaty then, we have the Article 3 nationally determined contribution. We have the understanding that we want it to reach measures that can guarantee us or at least make it possible to go well below two degrees of warming. This is going to mean sinks. It's going to mean capture. It's going to mean actions that actually take greenhouse gas emissions out of our collective atmosphere, not just limiting and changing our economies so that we're no longer producing as many. It means a lot of things, essentially. And the reason that I was possibly quite stupidly, suicidally even, um, standing up even as early as last year and saying we are going to get a treaty alongside the General Council of the UNFCCC, who was also saying that, but he's about to retire, <laughs> was because we could see that what they needed to do in the treaty and what they were proposing to do in the treaty was to draw together a series of already agreed mechanisms and make them work. So in Warsaw, we agreed a mechanism on loss and damage. In Cancun, we agreed a set of rules that could be applied along with safeguards for reducing emissions for um, uh, deforestation and um, uh, land degradation. Um, red and red plus, right? In Durban, we agreed on the actual way forward, but we also came to several other agreements. In Lima, we agreed on gender and education arrangements. In um, Doha, we agreed a gateway mechanism to be able to help facilitate transfer of technology. The articles of the treaty that you can see when you read through it are based on and accepting of and bringing into the new agreement those already agreed mechanisms. So they make it all part of what countries can use to reach their nationally determined contributions in Article 3, and in particular to achieve the purpose of the treaty, Article 2, you know, mitigation, adaptation, and finance. I promised Marcus I would populate this talk with anecdotes from negotiations. It's a politics and a law discussion, right? So here's one that might be kind of amusing. Research and independent NGOs, such as people who are facilitating a climate law and governance day, are given the funny, specially colored passes. In Copenhagen, most people who didn't have one of those funny, specially colored pass were told not to come in for the last two days because the um, police weren't aware of how to ensure that it was secure. Um, they hadn't expected 27,000 people, so they were having a bit of a rough time. And um, I remember in particular, on behalf of the independent um, uh, sort of research groups being asked to bear a pass for a day and being asked in particular to ensure that we were represented in a discussion about the structure of the future climate agreement, which at that time people still thought was going to be signed in Copenhagen. I walked through nine levels of security, getting searched each time, being told to leave different bags behind. And when I came into the room, there were only three seats left at the very front, so I slipped in and sat down. Everybody smiled at me, didn't know why. I was like, you're laughing because I'm late. I sit down, and a gentleman who now has older white hair, a lot of it, and big sticking out ears comes up just as somebody says, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States of America. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. That's why we had to be represented. And Barack Obama, who had just come back from receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, um, in Oslo and had made his way through Copenhagen on, said, the only thing the United States can agree to here, and from what I understand from my discussions over the last 24 hours, is a triangle. The same triangle that's reflected in the treaty text, actually. I can tell you that however many years it is later. It's going to be adaptation and mitigation commitments backed by a massive increase in finance that is needed to make those real and supported by transparency. Transparency was the code word for something that we all call verification, monitoring, reporting, and verification, actually, MRV. And that transparency framework 
is one of four main mechanisms that I think the new Paris Agreement brings us. So first, what Paris does by giving us Articles 7 and Articles 4 and Articles 5 and 6, which help us to understand the commitments that are being made in this treaty on adaptation and on mitigation, whether it's about using forest for mitigation or as a sink, whether it's about taking into account of and collaborating on insurance for loss and damage is part of your adaptation. These commitments are backed by a commitment to massively mobilize and direct climate finance. Now, I actually find that quite exciting, this idea of directing finance. I don't know if many of you hang out with a lot of people in the city of London, but I don't, I, don't, I don't see a lot of directing going on by even governments of finance. But I see a recognition in this treaty at Article 9 that the financial resources that are needed are going to have to come from the economy as a whole, and they're going to have to be redirected from where they're going currently. Now, I know not everybody participates in divestment decisions, nor should you have to, but if we are looking at this as an actual transformation of the world economy towards something that over time peaks and then goes down in terms of the amount of emissions that it generates, a low carbon, carbon constrained, green economy, whatever you want to call it, then yeah, some of that finance that is currently going to carbon intensive investment is going to have to be redirected. And the Paris Treaty recognizes that. It also then talks about even other parties, developing countries, Article 9.3 and 9.2, providing financial support themselves voluntarily. And here's another anecdote for you to make it real. Um, so there I was in the middle of, I can't remember, I think it must have been Cameroon. And there was a parliamentarian who kept boots, Wellington boots, behind his desk because he was in charge of disasters, <laughs> national disasters. He explained, I'm Monsieur le Catastrophe. I said, wow, that must make you popular in Parliament. And he said, well, they know I know all about it. And he puts on the boots when he gets a call, and he goes out there, and he's the parliamentarian who's talking about, you know, okay, this is a major problem. Um, it, we've just had all of this flooding. Uh, we've just lost these three coastal communities. And he was in Parliament arguing for the national budget to be putting 14% of its resources toward adaptation to climate change. And you know, he got it. This is a country with however many percentage today, I haven't read the human development report from December 15th with regards to Cameroon, but we're looking at over 30% below the poverty line in any number that you're looking at. And you're looking at unemployment that's high enough to create revolutions in France and they're still dedicating 14% of their national budget toward adaptation. Why? Because it's survival. Okay. And they want to make sure that those resources, which they are spending from their limited tiny pot, are spent on effective mechanisms. That is part of what Article 9 really means. It goes beyond taking it seriously. So this transparency, global stock taking, and peer review the mechanisms that are set up, not just by Article 13 with the transparency provisions, but also by the related aspects of the adoption decision and by Article 14 on the global stop take, essentially mean that not only do we put the national contributions in their written form submitted by countries to the NFCCC Secretariat online and we make them available to everyone, but we sit down as countries together and we say, hmm, Okay, this is still at 3.4 degrees. And uh, if we don't do something according to the IPCC and our other scientists, you'll be the US president who loses Florida. We better announce that right away, shall we? And then they discuss how we can get a little bit tighter in our national contributions to maybe not be that guy or lady, right? And that happens for every country. So the transparency, the reporting, the stock take, the peer review, and also um, the political consequences of that as the science becomes clearer, coupled with a compliance mechanism, a technology transfer and collaboration mechanism, a sustainable development mechanism that looks a lot to me like a nationally determined contribution with the clean development mechanism from the Kyoto Protocol and taken into account, 
um, but could be quite different and interesting. All of these mechanisms together are to help the countries to meet their nationally determined contributions and go further, right? And if they're having trouble going further, there's a compliance and implementation mechanism where they come together, they admit that they're not meeting their objectives, and they ask for help. And there's funding made available to ensure that you know, the 50,000 experts arriving on your door tomorrow with the UNDP and IDLO and UNEP and everybody else who feels like it um, coming and offering you help to get to your service. I mean, you might want to just try to meet your commitment to get rid of all these people, right? But the idea behind it is to work a little bit the same way that the nearly successful ozone treaty did and make the space for countries that are having trouble to admit it and to take on new actions, new policies, new measures, new laws, sure, but also new science, new technologies. All right? And that's what the Paris Agreement sets up. The implementation and compliance mechanism isn't conflictive. It's not naming and blaming. It's not saying you four people in the environment ministry didn't manage to convince your finance ministry colleagues today that this was important, and so you're still spending money on oil and gas exploration, you idiots. Because that doesn't get you anywhere in a sustainable development world. I still think it's very valuable, and I especially like it when NGOs do it, because I think it helps people to understand the urgency of the matter. And it's understood that blaming government is part of their job, really. But in the end, it has to go deeper. It has to be the countries and the societies themselves who, like Monsieur de Catastrophe, own the answer and are making it happen because they're actually committed to it. And Paris, unfortunately, as a strength and as a weakness, depends on that. If people think that by finding this treaty, they've solved climate change and go happily on to the next crisis, we've lost. Now, speaking as someone who's very comfortable with failure at the moment, after 17 years of deadlock, knowing that our international treaty under Kyoto wasn't gonna happen, it wasn't gonna work, it was doing the opposite of limiting the world's emissions to something safe, um, maybe I'd be perfectly happy about that. I'm actually not, but, but say I could be. But the most vulnerable countries, the ones who are actually going to lose their entire territory. The equally, we've got a lot to lose, developed countries that are going to lose billions and billions of dollars of investments and damage in their own countries. Hopefully, they won't because they'll have realized what changes need to be made and they'll be serious about them. But if they do, those actors under Paris are not just intended to come together, they're almost forced to it. The structure of the agreement itself forces them to be accountable for what their country is or is not achieving in terms of emission reductions, in terms of carbon sinks, in terms of adaptation measures, in terms of ways of addressing loss and damage for their citizens, in a way that takes into account human rights. Put that in for Mary Robinson. Um, it made it into the preamble, but equity also made it into the purpose and that's actually huge in terms of what we can achieve. So then the paper that I'm presenting today takes a look using the lens of the New Delhi Declaration and the principles of international law that were gleaned from a study of about 300 treaties and mm, about 20 years of jurisprudence um, from international courts and tribunals and uh, most of the literature um, and the Rio Declaration, among other soft law instruments, the seven New Delhi principles include the duty of states to ensure sustainable use of natural resources, the principle of equity and eradication of poverty, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, um, and you can take into account different national circumstances and different capabilities in, under that one, the principle of the precautionary approach, the principle of public participation, access to information and justice, good governance principle, and the principle that economic development is to integrate the social and environmental aspects of that development. It can't be externalized anymore. Those seven principles, when one does a study of the treaty, one finds in spades. They're guiding the decisions all the way through. In terms of public participation and access to information and justice, just to pick one, the adoption decision at paragraph 14 recognizes that without that public participation, without that access to information, without that accountability mechanism that societies need to be able to apply, um, we won't have success in the new framework of Paris, established by Paris. We won't have the global responses to climate change that are needed. 
It sets up new public participation mechanisms. It recognizes in Article 12 that there will be an enhanced education, training, public awareness, public access to information, public participation throughout the nationally determined contributions and the societies that have adopted them and are using them to shape their economies. Mm -hmm. What we actually need to take a look at and think about a little bit more, even though access to justice is actually not addressed directly in terms of countries being able to take um, each other or others to court in the ICJ, parties are expected to access the same dispute settlement mechanisms as the UNFCCC itself, and that does refer to the ICJ, but in very specific and limited circumstances, never been used, not even for advisory opinions, in spite of the efforts of Tuvalu and Sri Lanka and others. So what we have to really think about here in terms of loss and damage, in terms of liability and compensation, those of us in the room who are lawyers, is what's the best way? Do you try to get a law that holds a government to account so it has to compensate you? You know, do you try to get the foxes who are in charge of the hen house to come up with a, a mea culpa framework? Or do you go through private law? Do you go through litigation? The lawyers that met in Climate Law and Governance Day were actually very clear about this. They said, we don't expect the treaty to get us liability and compensation. The chances of countries like the US signing on to that when they're a monist legal system and the law can be directly applied in their Washington the day after the treaty signed, this isn't going to happen. But we're helping countries like Tuvalu to adopt compensation acts, which if you then sued in New York or London, would be the law applied to whether or not there's been loss and damage. And we think that's a valuable contribution, they said. <clears throat> I need to think about that a little bit more. I remember in a conversation with the OECD um, on an investment panel um, uh, a few years ago in The Hague, hearing from a lady who said it's just impossible that we have anything on liability and compensation. Loss and damage, yes, but liability, no. And I said, oh, absolutely, I think you're right. Probably if someone was really worried about loss and damage, they could just um, you know, sue in Mississippi like we did on tobacco. Bit of a you know, lengthy process, thousands and thousands of court cases late, later and a whole lot of damages, you know, eventually they got there and she looks at me and she says, what? I said, well, you know, that's what happens if governments can't come to an agreement. Everybody goes to their own courts and eventually someone wins. <clears throat> Urgenda case, <clears throat> similar in Pakistan just recently, I hear. You know, that would be an interesting way for it to develop. He said, oh, maybe it would be better if we had a multilateral <laughs> agreement on this. I said, I agree with your earlier statement. I don't think you're going to get one. You're going to have to talk to their lawyers. Good luck on that. And, and it was an interesting uh, development in Paris that even though we got recognition of loss and damage, even though we got recognition of the um, need to collaborate on insurance, what we didn't get was an acceptance of liability and compensation. What we also fortunately didn't get was a strict and clear limit on any liability and compensation. Essentially, the adoption decision provision, if I'm reading it correctly and my colleagues are correct, um, from Bangladesh and others who worked on it, um, simply says the treaty is silent on this. The treaty doesn't give any new rights, and it doesn't refer to this and, you know, take away any of those rights either. I think that's as good as they could have gotten. Okay, I've walked you through the treaty. I've explained why I see some glimmers of hope there. Um, I'll flag that they have a cute little statement in the preamble that says that um, some countries care about climate justice. It's in the same provision as it talks about the countries that care about Mother Earth. So I, I think I can probably guess who's who in that crowd. But um, it'll be interesting to see what, over the years, this all comes to mean. What I think we need to take home as a concluding message is that, one, the implementation quite deliberately depends on the efforts of all the countries that were in the room that made the commitment not just their governments, but their universities, their lawyers, their investors, their civil society activist groups, their politics departments, their research centers. Yeah, so that's the first one. If the implementation fails this time, the treaties make space for everybody, but that also means it's all on us. Very different world than the traditional vision of international law, right? where you can comfortably get, blame the government alone. Mm -hmm. The second thing that I would like to uh, suggest, I've spoken specifically about the climate change agreement, 
there's a regime, many regimes overlapping, that have been built around this agreement. Alongside, there's a whole set of international economic law, human rights law, environmental law that is equally relevant. So embedded, situated in a broader scheme of obligations. That would be my second main point where I think future research is needed, but I also think we need to be very clear. If your investment agreement discourages certain types of investments in accordance with national policy and encourages um, renewables, that investment agreement, I think, is trying to support Paris. It serves to be encouraged. And then my third take-home message, and it's probably the, the most exciting one, at least, for someone like me, is that in all of these nationally determined contributions, and in their five-year global stock-taking and review process, it's going to be up to us as a research community to help with the spotting of errors, to help with the collation of data, to help with the um, whether this measure works and why and under what conditions and how to make it better, and training the people who will make it better. So the bottom-up approach that is adopted by Paris, the we review, see how we're doing, help each other to do a better job, assume that people do want to meet their commitments in international law. That's actually a principle of international law, by the way, good faith. And assume that what's happening is that we're not still strong enough as a world community, as countries, as governments, as actors, to, to do it, and we need to help each other. That bottom-up approach might actually be a new way of making and implementing international law. Bring it on. Thank you. That's a fascinating talk. I think I'm bearing a little bit more towards the optimistic side now, although I still have a few a few doubts in my mind. Um, so um, we have we have some time uh, for questions. I think I'll take um, I anticipate quite a few. So I think I'll, maybe I'll take two or three at a time, and you can respond to those um, in one in one go. So who'd like to, to get the ball rolling? Yes, please. Um, just in reference to your second concluding point about the. <coughs> context of the legal frameworks and agreements that this is situated within. Um, and my uh, understanding of this is that that's where energy needs to be focused, in that how the implementation of legally binding treaties like TPP, TTIP, TSA are going to be operationalizing the targets which can take us towards or away from the kind of outcomes we want from the Paris Agreement. And so looking at those legally binding treaties is actually where people who come from this this politics should be applying their energies because that's that's where the, the legally binding treaties are. Um, and I'd ask a response to that. Okay, I think there was a question here before. Yes, please. Thanks for your very insightful speech. And I would like to ask you specifically in relation to the indigenous people and the climate change. Could you elaborate a little bit more about your observation and what are things that are newly added in this uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting point. Yes, thank you. Okay, another one to add to that, to that mix? Yes, please? I was just wondering, Mary Claire, if you could elaborate a little bit more on the fact that the enforcement branch that was in Kyoto was mm -hmm. not taken up again. I understand that generally that's politically more difficult and that we're going towards a facilitated you know, agreement, but I'm just wondering what the impact could be with the absence of a state. Okay, nice, nice range of questions there, if you can Yeah, it is actually. I'm just realizing that among the documents that I left in my kitchen counter were, was the copy of the treaty itself. Um, luckily, the paper cites it in ad nauseum, actually, probably. But, um, okay, so starting with the issue of economic instruments and economic treaties in particular, um, I'm man after my own heart because, of course, that's one of my main areas of research. And, and I do, oh, you're absolutely brilliant, thank you. Um, and I think in particular, um, what I think international economic agreements do, and one of the strengths that I think we can draw from those regimes, whether it's the sort of large mega regionals or whether it's a small bilateral between Central America and the European Union or Canada, Mexico and the USA, is a deal. There's, a, there's an economic deal that's being given there, which from a sustainable development perspective should not be discounted. The idea that we will give you market access, Peru, to the US, bilateral trade agreement, 
but only if you're willing to accept certain transparency and other provisions to ensure that the wood arriving isn't illegally logged. So that our market isn't becoming the incentive for denuding of your forests and climate change. Now, I'm actually citing, obviously, from a real trade agreement where there is such a set of provisions and there has been resources put toward (laughs) inspections of exact shipments to find out whether the wood was illegally logged. It's not helping the grand problem of illegal logging, but it's starting to move toward um, a globalization that means something where just as you're not supposed to take illegal timber as your business model from U.S. forests, you also can't do it in Peru and sell it in the U.S. I do see that as positive. But, and this is where I get to my second point on the economic agreements, legally binding, etc., they're also facilitative in a special way. You can look at a trade relationship or an investment relationship between two countries or even an entire region, and you can point to what products are being traded, Which ones will probably increase if you take down the tariff barriers, and by how much? What their social environmental impacts are. We even have sustainability impact assessments, environmental reviews, environmental assessments we call them in Canada, but what we actually do is call them meaningless. What we can see there is a possibility of looking at specific trade flows, specific investment flows, in specific products or services, and an intervention point. At the border, we either tariff you or we don't, and by this much, In our departments of investment promotion, et cetera, we either incentivize you or we make it more difficult through additional, quote, red tape. And that is a very special contribution. I'm talking in terms of renewable energy and climate change, but you can look equally at some of our other biodiversity, desertification, or or other large conventions. So I believe that these have to be firmly linked. I don't see any argument as an international lawyer to someone who is holding up, well, you know, that's just your idea that illegal logging isn't a good idea. Number one, it's illegal in your country. (laughs) Okay, so don't tell me you support it. And then number two, of course, we've got all of these binding multilateral, almost universal treaties, which say that we're trying to reduce this from being done. With the Paris Agreement, we say we're trying to get carbon sinks through the forest. So all we're doing here is we're using that one intervention of trade policy to be able to achieve that specific cut in the flow of illegally harvested timber and change those incentives. Great. Yes, it's a good start. And is it binding? Only as much as the people who are um, uh, signing the agreement and able to control the trade can make it binding. If all you've done is deviate the trade to China where it can be used for even fair trade or FSC certified wood because 40% can come from unknown sources, we haven't tightened the system enough. So that is, that is the caveat and also the, the weakness of that argument. But I, I think it is an important part of it. We had a quick question on Indigenous people's rights, and um, I'll try to address it quickly. Um, the rapporteur on Indigenous people's rights, Vicky, was actually on the panel that we hosted on the final day of the climate negotiations on Friday. And she was incredibly eloquent about not just what Indigenous people's rights meant in the context of this treaty, in terms of adaptation, mitigation, finance, participation in decision making, and why it was so important that any measure that a government takes on climate change has to take into account and involve Indigenous people. But she also spoke very, very well about the contributions that Indigenous people can and do make already to adaptation and mitigation. And she said that even though the measures that were being contemplated at that time in the preamble of the treaty and and are there, saying that we need to respect and consider and integrate, take into account indigenous people's rights and all human rights in our measures, she said that only gets you halfway. She said that indigenous peoples are players and they should actually be able to be part of the efforts and they should be recognized for the part they play. And I think she was very wise in saying that. It means that Indigenous peoples and all those who care about human rights aren't confined to that one provision of the preamble and a reference to equity in Article 2. They're part of the public participation arrangements, they're part of the adaptation arrangements, they're part of the technology transfer arrangements when we talk about traditional knowledge that can be shared. So they're part of the entire treaty. Um, The question that I'm going to be asking the folk who are designing the rules for the financing, and especially the global climate funds, is, okay, so what does that mean in terms of some financing also being provided? And, and I think that's still going to be one of the areas where it, it becomes more clear or not um, when we look at the rules of those funds. 
and who can apply and how. Because in some countries, just the fact that it's only your national government that can apply makes it inaccessible, right? So that, that, that's going to be, I think, one of the key issues that we need to look for here. In terms of enforcement and the Kyoto Protocol, I have a friend who's working on a paper on exactly this topic. She and her entire research group don't have an answer yet. Um, what, what I can't help coming back to as an international lawyer who actually cares about sustainable development is that if a mechanism hasn't been working, I'm not sure how long we want to flog the dead force. And I realize that's a bit controversial because I, I fully sympathize with the people who want binding targets and penalties and let's be. And there's some really innovative work around clubs yes, going further indeed. and faster that yes. I think is, yeah. is really worth looking at there where binding agreements are taken between those who will and, and, and those treaties are, are respected as well and become part of the effort. But somewhere along the line, um, I've worked in too many countries <laughs> to really believe that it's all about, oh, we just can't be bothered. I see major gaps in funding. I see major gaps, hypocritical gaps, in capacity. I see incentives being offered to oil companies as long as they're from somebody's country and um, barriers being put up to renewables um, because they're from the EU and not the US or whatever else the reason is. And I think somewhere along the line, even stupid things like jurisdictions where, you know, oh, we can't possibly do wind because our country and their country are shaped like this, and so we've got to have a nuclear facility here because we can't get the wind from them. Okay, at some point, we're going to need to take a more cooperative and facilitative approach to this. If it doesn't work, we're going to need a much stronger world government before we can make our enforcement mechanisms um, work correctly. Either that, or we're going to have to look at something like the WTO, where you know, the membership has its privileges idea. Um, uh, the economic incentives make it impossible for a country not to eventually comply. Yeah? Because I, I'm not certain the penalties thing, having watched my country withdraw humiliatingly from Kyoto in order not to pay their bill after they lost the poker game. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Marika. Unfortunately, I think we are out of time. Um, there's another group wanting to come into the lecture theatre. But this is definitely a conversation that, that will keep going for many months, many years to come. So I'm, I'm sure you'll all want to join me. And thank you, thank you, Marika, very much for giving up her lunch hour to enlighten us. <laughs>